pray with me a prayer of thanks real quick. Our Father and our God, earlier today, knowing that Brother Tony was not feeling well, we prayed for him, that you might strengthen him, grant him grace, that he might uh, complete his task and deliver the message you put on his heart. And, and you came through for us, God, and for Brother Tony, and we give you thanks for that. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'm about to do, I have honestly never done before. Uh, I mean, I give short parts of testimony of my life, but I've never done what I'm about to do. So don't get worried. <clears throat> I hope that you trust me, that the Lord is in me, not to uh, do anything too weird. Uh, pages 30 through 34 is a passage of, of uh, songs that has to do with the Lord leading us. Do you believe the Lord leads you? Amen. I think it's also important not only to believe that, but to point to areas of your life where you say, yes, the Lord did this. The Lord did this. So this afternoon, real quickly, I'm going to talk to you about some trees. I hope you like this. I hope it's helpful to you. And I just, every time I talk with somebody, though, it seems like something comes up to add to my testimony. And just a little while ago, um, Brother Jason, Sister Ada, and Brother Sue, and Sister Sue, and Ann and I were sitting there and Sister Ada was telling us about some unusual experiences she had uh, dealing with people ministering to them in California. And Sister Ada, I just want to tell you and confess before everybody that I too had a former life. And you might share this with those people. In a former life, I was uh, dead to God. But in a present life, I'm alive to God. So I have lived multiple lives. Use that sometime. Okay? Well, my testimony begins in 1860, so help me get through this quick, okay? There was a man, his name was Dinwiddie, do not know his first name, he was from Kentucky. 1860, you know what was going on then, so they moved to the Olathe area of Kansas, which was not yet a state. There, his wife, who remained nameless because we have no historical record, gave birth to a son by the name of James. At the same time, on a different branch of the tree, there was a man by the name of Winneman. Don't know his last name, his first name, but his wife gave birth to a son by the name of Phil. Two completely different branches of this tree, I'm going to tell you, because the one had a, had a history of acknowledging Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and the other had a history of following, following in the institutional Catholic Church. John, uh, James married. They had a son. His name was John. Right. Phil, who was a child here, had a son. His name was Ed, Edward. About pretty close to the same age. John's a little older than Edward. Now, God looks down upon John and says, I am going to give you a wife. And she's going to have a son. And then I'm going to take her from you and leave you with that child, no one to care. Now God looks down and he looks at Ed. And he says, I'm going to give you a wife. And you're going to have a son. And you're going to have a daughter. And then I'm going to take that wife from you. And never again in your life will you find a woman, a wife, that will replace that wife. Yet you will raise those two children. I go back over here and John then is blessed with a new wife. I won't go into the details because it might scare some of you mothers to death. You can ask me later. But gets a new wife to replace the wife. And says, I'm going to give you ten children. Five of them are going to be born live. But one of those five I'm going to take when she is five. 
But one of those children I'm going to give you is going to be Lloyd. And so I have this Lloyd Dinwiddie over here, and I have this Elizabeth Winneman over here. And God says, I'm going to give Elizabeth a husband. And this husband is going to take Elizabeth, and he is not going to love her. And they're going to have a son, and then she's going to become pregnant with another son. And then, he, then she is no longer going to find pleasure in his eyes. And he's going to send her, the son in her, and the little boy back home to Ed. We've got Lloyd over here who's in the military. Now, I want you to remember right now, I've got Lloyd. And over here, I've got Ed up here. Unusual circumstances happened for this to come about. Ed, while he was in the military, he was a horseman in the cavalry. All right? I have a picture on my wall of their whole outfit, all of them there. You can tell which one is my grandfather. Everybody's sitting there stone-faced except the guy on the front on the end looking like a complete rascal. I don't know if I inherited that or not, but you can pick him out. So they're fighting in the Yukon, and God says, I am going to destroy that entire core of men, except Ed, and allow him to live. Lloyd is in the military. He's in Okinawa in between World War II and Korea. And for some reason, God put in his mind and two other people that for three years they're not going to take leave. So that in the end, they can have an early out of the military for three weeks. So that's what Lloyd did. Lloyd and his two friends took the early out. Unknown to him, a week after they left Okinawa, their entire outfit was shipped to Korea. The first day there, their base was bombed and they were all killed. So I look at my family tree and I say, okay, I came within one on this side of not existing. I came within three on this side of not existing. I'm going to tell you that in each one of these things, this had to be the hand of God or I would not be here before you. As you go forward, here is Betty with the two boys and here is Lloyd. He marries her and takes these boys as his own. God gives to Lloyd and Betty three more children. A girl and then a boy. Six years later, there comes another boy, quite a surprise. Due near her birthday, October 18th. October 18th comes and passes. A month later, she is in the Humphreys Clinic in Tuscumbia, Missouri. And she is giving birth. And she gives birth to a baby boy who's a month overdue. And he's not breathing. And he doesn't breathe. And for 28 minutes, the doctor tries to get him to breathe, and it doesn't work. And so she puts him up on the shelf where my mother still in the room, and in sadness walk, turns and walks out of the room. The next door is another birthing room. And when he approaches that door, he hears a smack and a scream of a baby. It was his daughter being born. What would you do in that case? I'll tell you what he did. And I don't know why he did this, because this is unusual, man. You put yourself in that case. Where would you be? This doctor turned around and went back into that room and went over there and picked up that body of that baby. And this came to me from the testimony of my own mother several times. 
and raised this child up in the air and said, God, this child does not have to die and begin smacking the bottom of the man that is standing up here talking to you. And so life came to me. Unusual, isn't that? Now, if you've ever wondered what was wrong with me, you know. <laughs> My life went right along. Here I was, the baby, and there's a lot of details I'm not going to tell you about. But God worked in my father and mother. My mother did not come from a believing background, and my father was marginal, although he was raised by a, a woman and a man who honored God. Things just weren't working for him. And so they, they're, this is, you know, middle 50s. They're trying to earn a living. Midwest, it's hard. They, have, they live in a the house. They're going to sell this house, move into another house. Something happens and both houses sell at the same time. They're without a house. And my father, who has to build a house, decides he's going to, he's going to build his house. He didn't have all the money he needed to buy all the tools. This never stops a good man. He went to the trash and pulled out a vanilla bottle. Any of you... Older saints, remember the vanilla bottles that were flat? He took a vanilla bottle and he filled it almost completely with water, took it down to the hardware store and put a level up there so that it was level, set the vanilla bottle on it and then put two marks on either side of the bubble so he could have a level to build a house. Don't stand in the way of that kind of person. We moved into this house. Why did God have them both of these houses sell at the same time, especially one that was rat infested, Dave. How did this happen? I don't know, but God did it. Well, why did he build this house here? Because there was a woman down the street who had four boys. This woman went to the 9th Street Christian Church. Now, we, we lived almost next door to, to who would become one of the most well-known evangelists in the Christian church in the United States and loved this man. He was a minister for 12 years, but he was scared to death of my wife because she was raised Catholic. And do you know what was taught in the Bible colleges in the 50s and 60s regarding Catholics? I mean, this is like of the devil. You just stay away from these people. Well, Betty down the street had not heard that message. So she goes up and she talks to, to Betty... Betty, Betty, <clears throat> we've got a thing called Vacation Bible School. It starts at 9 o'clock in the morning, lasts till 3, and it's two weeks long. Can I have your children? Yes. Here's what happened. Over the course of the next two years, my family, much older than me, came to Christ. And then, a little later, a day came for me. And I remember that day on June 20th, 1969, when I was baptized into Christ. I remember all the events of that meeting very well. But something else happened. And that was the tree that I had grown up in from 1860 on my branch was ripped out of that tree. And it was grafted in another tree. I became part of a new family. It was at that point that my life and my testimony began interacting with other people who had been yanked out of their tree and grafted into that tree. And over the course of my life, I began to come in contact with them. Now, there was a lot of details that got me from, from my baptism to the time when I entered into the preaching ministry. A lot of details. But one thing that happened was that sometimes when I would, would we, Anna and I would go place with our children, we would meet people, I mean like kindred spirits, and we would never depart from each other. We walked into a little church in Novelty, Missouri one time, and, 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 and the, there we came in contact with the family, and uh, many of you know them. And some of you are married to them. And some of you are related to them. And what happens is we moved in there. 
And to people, I knew nothing about farming, cared nothing about farming. But God said, Bill, you need a best friend on this life, in this world, besides your wife, a living person. Here he is. His name is Russell. I thought, oh, Lord, he's a farmer. Yes, he is. And he's your best friend. And he has a wife, and she's going to be your wife's best friend. And they have four children, and you have two children. And between the six of them, they're all one year apart. And guess what? They're going to be best friends. And they're going to follow you. This is what God did. So I have to say this in all humor. <clears throat> Some of you brethren here, if, you, you know, if you're a little bit uneasy with me, you better just kind of suck it up and, and thank the Lord because he used me to get your spouses to you. <laughs> My life goes on. Minister this place and that place. Sometimes you meet people, you know, Brother Given, sometimes you meet people that aren't exactly the most godly person but gives you great ideas for the ministry. Is that not right? Yeah. Happened to me too. There was a, a man here in Joplin, and I hope to arrive in heaven and find out he's my brother. That's what I'm really hoping for. But he told me one day, he said, you know what, Bill? There's something we don't have in this country that we desperately need. And I said, what's that, Jim? He said, we need a preacher with a message. He said, there was a time when evangelists had messages. Anymore, we just got a bunch of people who can stand up and talk about various subjects. We need a man with a message desperately. And I thought, yeah, that sounds good. Life went on for me, but this thought never left me. And I ministered here and there and preached several thousand sermons and different things. Last year, after a long series of different studies in the scripture, I heard a message. And this message, and this, this preacher preached, and he said that God did not count what David did to Bathsheba as sin. And uh, that, that, that's just wrong. That was sin. He said, God didn't count that against him. I said, that's wrong. And so I began to read. And I was reading in Psalm 51 where David there is talking about his situation with him and God after this effect. And do you know what? David's appeal to God. I mean, it's more than just out of guilt. He's really wanting God. And he makes this comment. Restore unto me the joy of, my, of thy salvation. It was missing. And I began to consider preaching that I had listened to in the area where we're at, Christians that I had met, and I thought, they do not have the joy of the Lord's salvation. It is apparent. And my first thought was, they've got sin in their life. But some of these people that I met, I couldn't identify. There was no glaring gross sin in their life. Reading some more, I was reading in the book of Galatians. Brother Given taught me to love the book of Galatians, by the way. Paul writes in there, after these people had felt the effects of this legalist doctrine, what has happened to your blessedness? Galatians 4.15. Another translation says, who has stolen your joy? The blessedness and joy are closely related. And it, it dawned on me. It's not simply personal sin that robs you of your, the joy of the Lord's salvation because you feel separation from it. You can actually believe a corrupted gospel, a perverted gospel, and it can absolutely strip you of the joy of the Lord's salvation. And I began to look at what was preached, what was being believed. And I want to tell you this. I hope I'm not going too far out on a limb to say this. From the time I was very small, there was core or fundamental teachings brought to me. And that was this. That when, when I was baptized into Jesus Christ, 
I was given the hope of eternal life. I believe that. I've always believed that. I mean, it's like I took hold of the hope set before me. And when I took hold of it, it was like, like that, you know. You say, well, what in the world's in you? Well, that is the joy of the Lord's salvation. It has energized you. It's inexpressible. It's full of glory. And it's in you because you have taken hold of that hope. And I firmly believe, always have, that the Lord Jesus is now on the throne. His reward is with him. And when he appears, he is going to give to me from his reward. And I am going to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. And that heaven is waiting for me. But I'm going to tell you this, and this is what I'm saying going out on a limb a little bit, and I do not want to offend anybody. I do not want to offend anybody. But there is much preaching going on today that like has heaven out of the picture. It has Jesus coming, coming to earth through a variety of different manners and being here for a thousand years and it just pushes aside my hope of heaven for a thousand years. I'm going to tell you there is no joy in that. There is no reward in that. I mean, I was thinking sarcastically the other day, and I'm thinking, so what is Jesus going to do? Come down here, hold the reward, and say, hey, I got it, but you can't have it for a thousand years? This does not make sense to me. I have no joy in this. There are doctrines that are being taught that do nothing but suck the joy of the Lord's salvation from you. Amen. And then it dawned on me. I began writing, I was telling Brother Mike about what one of my projects that I'm doing. I'm writing 52 devotions on the subject of the joy of the Lord's salvation to give to people. I'm going out and meeting preachers and talking with them about that. I want to know, is the joy of the, your, of the Lord's salvation right there? And here's what I ask them, point blank. When you knew that you had a reward in heaven... When you knew that at that point, did anything else in, mat in, in earth matter? When you were lost and then you knew you were saved, did anything else matter? No. Then I ask them, well, what happened? I mean, what happened, folks? The joy of the Lord's salvation does not get old. It does not wear out like some garment. What happened? One of two things. Personal sin or you've been subjected to doctrine that is hopeless. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I thought to myself, I have a message. I have a message. The message is uniquely tied to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel gives us the Savior, Jesus the gospel gives us an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, reserved for us in heaven. And that is my message. And if you ask me to come and speak, I will tell you about the message that God has put on my heart. So God has led me, and those were the limbs of my tree, and then he yanked me out of that tree, grafted me in history and my life has been punctuated by God saying here's what I'm going to do now so that I can get to this here's what I'm going to do now so that I can get to this and the only thing I encourage you to do is look at your own life and say what did God do in my life to get me where I'm at and give him thanks and give him praise and don't be so embarrassed about ancestors that you've had that didn't follow God because sometimes, you know what? He used them to get the people in the right place so that he might use you as his servant. And I just want to leave you with that today. Thank you very much.